Hi, I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your coach, Adrian Schneer, and I am so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to spend some here with me. Today, I'm going to talk about something that we've talked about before on the podcast, but that so many people don't want to talk about. Out of shame, out of embarrassment, out of disappointment, out of fear, out of fear of failure. And that is having to rewrite a standardized test. At this time of year, many of the schools have accepted their last or are soon, will soon be accepting their last scores for their standardized tests for the current application cycles. And so a lot of us may be stressing out about, well, what if I didn't score high enough? What if I have to retake the test again? What if I don't get in? These are all valid concerns, totally valid concerns. And the thing that nobody's talking about is that most people have to rewrite their standardized tests. We've had so many amazing guests on this podcast who have rewritten, all of whom I think, actually, who have rewritten their standardized tests to get into their programs, to get into their schools. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. These tests, these standardized tests, whether it's the MCAT or the LSAT or the DAT or any other standardized test, the GMAT, whatever it is, these are all skills-based tests, meaning that these tests are not intuitive. We have to learn the strategies and learn how to implement them. And if something is off in our strategy, then we may not be scoring like we'd like. Now, the other piece of this, there are two pieces of this. The first is that we may have to rewrite some standardized tests. We shouldn't be ashamed about that. And I'm going to talk more about that in a second. The second piece of this is something that no one is going to tell you. No one is going to tell you this, that you don't need the highest score to get in. Now, just in case you didn't hear me, I'm going to say it again. You don't necessarily need the highest score to get in. In fact, my time on admissions committees has taught me over and over again, has shown me over and over again in my decision making and in the decision making of my colleagues that people with highest grades and the highest scores still don't get in. And one of the main reasons why is that their written materials are subpar. And This is so important for you to realize. The other thing that's sort of a sub part to this part about not needing the highest scores to get in, because you don't, you do not need the highest scores to get in. The other part here is that remember that the schools, the numbers that they release are averages or medians. The numbers that the schools release are averages or medians. Yes, some schools provide a cutoff, that's fine. But most schools are providing averages and medians for applicants who are successful. That means that people score lower, sometimes significantly lower, much lower, and sometimes quite a bit higher. So you should expect there to be an average and a median that is reported. And you don't need the highest score to get in. This is so important. I just had a coaching call today with one of our amazing community members. And they are so stressed out, as we all have been and as we all are during standardized test times, that they're not going to score high enough. Of course, that is something that we stress about when we're doing anything academic, when we're doing anything in relation to the goals that we want to achieve. We're always afraid that we're not going to do well enough. That's natural. 
The way we deal with it is another story. Now, one of the really important realizations during our conversation was that your score, quite honestly, just needs to be good enough. Good enough. It does not need to be the highest score. And you do absolutely need to spend time working on the other parts of your application, like your written part of your application, in order to be able to offset not having that high score. But even still, like I said, a high score is not a guarantee to getting in. A high score tells us that you can write a standardized test. And let me also be very clear about this. A high score or any score, a low score, an average score, an above average score, doesn't tell the committee anything about the kind of person you are. It doesn't tell the committee what kind of professional you're going to be. It doesn't tell the committee where you're going to be in five or 10 years. A low score, a medium score, an average score, a high score, your score, whatever it is, does not dictate the person that you are, the kind of student that you're going to be in that professional school. And it does not dictate the kind of professional that you're going to be. I want to be really clear about this. Your score does not define you. And again, this is counter to all of the other narratives that you're going to hear that are based in fear, based in scarcity, based in insecurity. You don't need the highest score to get in. You need your score to be good enough along with your other application materials. Schools actually care about who you are. They care about your written materials. And the score is sort of like this barrier to entry. This annoying thing that you have to do, that you have to pay money for, and that you might have to redo. I rewrote every single person, almost every single person that I know rewrote their standardized test in order to get into their professional school. But nobody talks about it. And so it's so important that you realize that your score does not define you the schools don't think that the school that the score defines you either and the schools actually do care about who you are so when you are studying for your standardized tests there are a few things that are really important number 1 is to remember that this is all part of a big learning experience and that you may have to write again and that's okay it's nothing to be ashamed of it means that you actually want what you're working towards and you're willing to do what you need in order to improve. And sometimes that means writing it again. Now, it's not just that you're rebooking and rewriting it. It's that you are thoughtfully reworking part of your strategy that didn't necessarily work the first time. And here to apply yourself, we work on that strategy with you. Whether it's study time, whether it's how you're studying, whether it's how you're putting in the effort, what kind of effort you're putting in, we really break it all down. How many times per week how many, what you're doing during those times per week, we break everything down and we help you analyze exactly what it is that you are doing. It's also really important for you to know in this vein of that you don't need the highest score in order to get in. It's also important for you to know that and to figure out when it's appropriate to cancel a score. Because right after you take a standardized test, there's an option to just cancel it before you get your score. And we also have had discussions about this because I've actually had a few clients in the last year who've come to me and said, listen, this is before we started working together. I wrote the LSAT or the MCAT or whatever it was, but I canceled it. I canceled my score. And I asked why. And they said, well, I just didn't feel like it went that well. I was really nervous about it. I said, well, did you finish it? you know, give or take a few questions. Sometimes time runs out and we miss a few questions at the end or we miss a logic game in the middle or something like that. Something there's something, you know, sometimes there's something that happens and we miss a few questions. And they say, you know, yeah, sometimes I missed a few questions, which is not a big deal, right? We obviously want to get to all the questions. Sometimes you end up bubbling in a few because all, especially, for example, on the LSAT, all the questions are worth the same amount. And you're not docked any points for 
for for wrong answers. And so bubbling in or bubbling in now, it's electronic. So uh, filling in answers just to fill in answers when you're getting close to the end is a reasonable strategy to use. We talk about sort of best strategies around that as well, best practices, because it happens, right? This is all natural stuff that happens and everybody thinks, oh my God, everybody else finished. What's wrong with me? No, people are getting in sometimes bubbling in the last few questions. Like we have to be able to sort of decrease the pressure cooker here a little bit because this is this process is normal. All of these things that you're experiencing studying for your test is normal. So we have to tell the truth about what is going on here. We have to tell the truth about our experiences because every, I'll tell you from my experience, not only as an applicant, but also working with students for over a decade and at Apply Yourself since 2015, we're all having these same concerns. What if, what if, what if? I didn't finish the last, you know, three, five, you know, questions. So I had to bubble in or I had to fill in answers for, the, for this game or for that question or whatever it is. It happens. It happens. Is it the end of the world? No. Do we feel like it's the end of the world? Maybe, but we have to remind ourselves that it's not. And so as we're studying for our tests, we need to remember that the tests don't define us. Our scores don't define us. They are the hurdle to entry that we are working on. And you don't necessarily need, you don't need, not necessarily, you don't need the highest scores to get in. And realizing that, should help you feel a little bit more free. It should alleviate a little bit of pressure because what you do need is strategy that helps you improve from one test to the next, from one from one test date to the next. You're also working on your strategy during your time tests. During your time tests, the strategy that you're using and that we help you develop here is one that you actually go back and review the answers that you got right and the answers that you got wrong equally doing those tests, those test sections timed. Sometimes we do them untimed, depending on where you are in the process, what the strategy is, and we can talk about that. But it's really important to understand that there is actually different strategy and your strategy evolves even studying for one test, just for your first try or your second try or whatever it is, your strategy evolves through that process anyway. And then certainly there's a huge benefit to writing that test a second time if you need to. Now that you've written it the first time or the second time or the third time, there are things that we learn every single time. So back to my point about canceling your test score question that I often receive, the comment that I often receive is, I've canceled my score. And I ask them why. They say, I didn't feel good about it. Did you miss anything? Oh, maybe a few questions, but, you know, all in all, you know, I, I wrote the test, finished it. And it turns out that they canceled the test 99% of the time because they were insecure. Now, here's the thing. They may have gotten in with that score. They may not have had to write again. And schools typically take your highest score. They don't take an average typically. And so there are exceptions, of course, but you may have gotten in with that score that you canceled. So what's my advice around canceling scores? My advice around canceling scores generally is not to do it unless something horrible has happened. For example, you got sick during the test and you could only finish half of it. That is an extenuating circumstance that I would warrant a discussion about canceling the test. If you truly didn't fill in half the test, that would be a reason for canceling. And there are a few others, but that's generally along, they're, they're generally along that, that line. The other piece of it is that even if schools take your highest score, they still do see that you wrote the first time or the second time. They see the number of times that you wrote in the period that you're permitted to write in. And they'll see that you're putting in the effort to write it more than once. And they'll see how you fared on all of your attempts. Now, of course, you want your test scores to continually increase, but I've also seen cases where that doesn't happen, where I've seen that somebody is writing a test, you know, two, three, four times, and the score is either hovering around the same, it might have improved a little bit, but then the next time it dropped. This happens. So 
we have to remember that writing multiple times is can be part of the process. And if it's part of your process, let it be. Don't be ashamed of it. There's nothing to be ashamed of there. It means you're trying. It means you're putting in effort. It means you care about what you're doing. And of course, it has to be supported with the right strategy. When we started this podcast, one of the things that I really wanted to talk about, and I'm so thankful to our guests that they, that they did talk about this and that they were comfortable sharing their experiences, as I have, that they did write more than once. Because I think it's so important for applicants to see that that is a normal part of the process, not to be ashamed of it. I know people who have left the city, as you know, I'm in Toronto, who've left the city to rewrite because they don't want anyone else that they know who could possibly be writing that same test date at the same location to see them because they already know that they wrote one time or two times or three times. So they actually would leave the city out of embarrassment to write the test. There are times, for example, that writing in an area or in a place where you're less likely to know, and of course, this is when testing was was in person. Now it's mostly remote. But when I was writing the the MCAT and the LSAT, as you've heard about in my journey, I made a conscious decision. I didn't leave the city, but I wrote in other in locations around the city, within the city, that people I knew were less likely to write in. Now, it's not because I was embarrassed or ashamed. I did write the LSAT twice. We've talked about that. I wasn't embarrassed or ashamed. I just didn't want any expectation. I didn't want, I just wanted peace. I think that's what it comes down to. I wanted peace and I wanted to be in my own little world while I was studying. And that's how I have been as a studier, as an academic when I'm or as a person, as a business owner, as whatever I am, when I'm working on something, I generally don't make it public that I'm doing that thing until I've achieved a certain point. And it's not because of embarrassment. It's because as a human being, I just need peace and quiet to do what I need to do without external expectation. So I actually rely very heavily and I've relied very heavily for as long as I can remember on internal validation rather than external validations. So much so that I, I'm writing the test for me, nobody else. So I just don't need anyone else to know about it. I don't need the pressure. I don't need the expectation. I'm doing this for me. It was the same, it was a very similar concept to the podcast episode with Jessica Lane, where, who is my vocal coach? I've been training with her and training in voice for over 15 years now. And I've never performed on a stage. I've never performed for anybody. I just do it for me because I like it. And so there is so much to be learned from doing things for yourself, not for other people, not for expectation. And that includes standardized test writing. And so what that might mean for you is you may need to go a little bit more internal. You may need to quiet the noise around you. You may need to work on this internal validation rather than external validation. And you need to give yourself peace, peace and quiet while you're going through these intense processes of growth. Even still, I'm done school. I spent a lot of time there. I didn't tell any, like I'll give you examples of what I didn't tell anybody about. Now, of course, not like my immediate family, but friends, not because they weren't supported, but because I just was doing things for me. I didn't tell anybody, for example, about my, about even applying to any of the programs that I applied to. Again, I'm not, it's not keeping things from anybody. It's doing things in the quiet that I needed in order to do them. I didn't tell anybody any of the schools that I was applying to or that I was even applying. I didn't tell anybody that I was writing standardized tests when I was writing them. I didn't tell anybody my master's thesis defense date. Everybody knew it was coming at some point because I was set to graduate, but I never said the date, never told anybody the date. But then afterwards, they all, they, everybody around me that I, that was in my circle, they, you know, I texted them or I called them and said, hey, it passed. You know, I have a master's now. This is great. Whatever. Didn't tell anybody about my PhD defense date until after. Everybody knew, you know, people know you're working towards something, but you don't owe people dates. You don't owe people dates. People who are truly supportive of you will let you have your process. 
And that's actually one of the most important lessons that we can learn. Didn't tell anybody about my defense date for my dissertation. Didn't tell anybody, with the exception of my family, of course. And then we had my supervisors and everybody, the whole committee over for lunch after. It was like the best day ever. I mean, maybe I'll do another episode on that because like the PhD defense date was actually so much fun. Oh, I loved it. Anyway, that's maybe another episode. Now I'm thinking about that. (laughs) It was so good. I didn't tell anybody about applying to law school. I didn't tell anybody about writing standardized tests. I didn't tell anybody when I wrote the MCAT years and years before that. Didn't tell anybody I applied to my to med school. Actually, probably until this podcast, people didn't know. What else? I, when I was starting my firm, oh, law school, when I, anytime I had, you know, tests or exams in its exam period, I didn't post anything. I didn't tell anybody. I did the tests. You study for them. You go in, you write them. We can talk about strategies for writing law school tests and exams. I'm happy to. And submit your questions, actually, if you have questions about any of this, submit your questions and I'll answer them on the podcast. We're doing a new series called Ask the Expert. So submit your questions. Everybody knew it's exam time. You know, people are posting their study notes on on Instagram, on whatever the social media apps, you know, were at the time. Instagram was certainly one of them. Facebook was also used more. And TikTok actually wasn't around at the time, but people were posting pictures of their study notes, pictures of them in the library. You will not find a single picture of me in a library studying. You will not find a single picture of my notes. You will not take, like, all this stuff for likes and for external validation is actually being, it's really harmful to us. It's harmful to our processes. We have to learn to turn inward, to focus inward and be aligned with ourselves, making choices that make sense for us rather than for the approval of other people. Because they're doing their own thing. And I know people who wrote standardized tests, they took pictures of, or even their law school exams or the bar in order to become a lawyer, to become licensed, taking pictures of all their study notes, and then they didn't pass. And then all of a sudden, they're scrambling to go to another city because everybody has now liked the post. You know how expensive that is? That post costs them thousands of dollars in hotel bills, in a train ticket, in gas, in whatever it was to get to another city so that nobody saw them rewrite the bar or their standardized test because they had posted it online and now they were ashamed that they had to rewrite it. That post cost them thousands of dollars and stress. Back to my point. When I was starting my law firm, Until all the papers were filed and everything was in order, I didn't tell anybody. I couldn't take on any clients anyway until all the papers were in order. So it's not like I could have just started taking clients. I needed everything to be in order. And I needed to be able to handle the volume of work that was going to come in. Everything needed to be in order. And so staying quiet, staying internal, that's not out of shame. That's actually out of protection for your health, for your well-being, for your mental health, for your mindset, for developing that trust in yourself, for doing it for yourself, for staying accountable to yourself, for staying committed to yourself and consistent with your efforts. That's for you. It's not for anybody else. So whatever you have to do, whatever steps you are engaging in for your advancement, those are all for you. They're not for public consumption. And then if something doesn't work, if a strategy didn't work, you don't need to feel like you need to give anybody else an explanation. You're doing it for you. So full circle, if you need to rewrite a standardized test, just do it. Do it. Here we will help you rework and revise your strategy so that it works for you. You don't need to publicize it. So don't need to seek the approval of others. You don't need the Oh, why are you doing this? Oh, that's so hard. Oh, how are you going to do this? Aren't you so busy? Oh, how are you going to fit this in with all your other stuff? Because we do. That's part of the strategy. We schedule. We don't obsess. We talked about that in a previous episode. We strategize and we work methodically and consistently toward our goals for us, not for anybody else. So if you have any questions about any of this, if this resonates with you, send me a DM on Instagram, at Apply Yourself Global, and let me know. And if you have a question, send me a DM at Apply Yourself Global or send me an email at hello 
at applyyourselfglobal.com and we will answer your questions on Ask the Expert on the podcast. And so that means that if you want to also submit a, an audio file, a recording, asking a question, you can do that too. So your voice will be right here with me and we will answer all of your questions. So, and you can do that in a DM. Just send me a voice clip with a question or more, more than one question, and we will get those answered. So thank you so much for joining me today and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at applyyourselfglobal and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode, leave this episode a review, and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.